I greet you in the name of Jesus the Christ on this fifth week of Lent. And I do want to lift up that uh, Easter time we will be celebrating one great hour of sharing, which is one, it's an international giving that we as a church have done for years. The Congregational Church does it, the United Church of Christ. And our giving to one great hour of sharing reaches people in disasters. It helps reform communities and churches. So we hope that you'll consider a gift to one great hour sharing um, as Easter approaches and into April. So we gather in this time, grateful for the green and growing things, for the lengthening of days, for the warming of weather. And so let us gather separate yet in spirit and together in the spirit of worship. I could clip it in, no biggie. And I do want to lift up uh, Thanksgiving for Teresa Eichel and her ministry, uh, music ministry guests along with Michael for our prelude today. And now will you join me in our call to worship. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me with myself, wash me. Wash me. Though I have felt your anger, I will again rejoice in your joy. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. And now let us join together in a lowly manger born. Now let us pray together. God of justice, mercy, and truth, we gather in your presence. We feel it in the warmth of the sun, the strength of the wind, the energy of the waves. They are signs of your constant love and your power to change and challenge our lives. God of justice, mercy, and truth, in your presence, we become aware of our own lives, individually and in community, where they measure up, where they fall short, where they are out of kilter. As your plumb line shows us what is true, help us to be true to ourselves, true to our history, true to our own story, true to you. This we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Our scripture lessons today move us away from Mark and to the Gospel of John. And uh, we first hear a short uh, message from the prophet Jeremiah. So I invite you to listen for the word of God. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put their, my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their inequity, iniquity, and remember their sin no more. And so we find Jesus in the Gospel of John now, after being anointed by Mary and his entry. Um, it actually happens after his entry into Jerusalem, so we're jumping ahead of the Palm Sunday a little bit. But no matter when this occurred, the message is for us today to consider. From God, John chapter 12, starting with verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. As Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Amen. All right. Good morning, children. Today I'm here. Miss Kay is down with her new grandbaby in Florida. I'd like to share this story about Easter. But to begin, we need to remember Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem on Christmas Day. But years before his birth, the prophets said that God's Son would come to our earth and would save our earth from sin. When Jesus became a man, he chose 12 men to be his disciples and helped him teach the world about God. When Jesus fulfilled in the teachings of his prophet with his disciples, he traveled on a donkey 
on the road to Jerusalem. The streets were lined with people laying palms on the street in front of him to greet him with the love and joy. This was the first Palm Sunday. Jesus went to a temple where people worshiped. Jesus was very upset and mad because men were selling and buying animals. He threw money boxes the men had, and this made the men very, very angry, and they ran away. The temple leaders were very angry and wanted to get rid of Jesus. Jesus went inside after they all left. He wanted to worship in the temple and, and pray. The chief priests and the elders of the temple asked Jesus many questions, trying to trick him. But Jesus said, love God with all your heart. A new co commandment. You must love your neighbor as yourself. This made the priests really upset. They grew more and more afraid of Jesus and looked for ways to arrest him. One night on the Passover meal, or as we call it, the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples sat and, he, and Jesus broke the bread and said, This is my body, give thanks to God, and he gave it to his disciples. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he passed a cup to them and said, This is my blood, which I shed for you. This was the last time Jesus ate with his disciples. They, they all went after supper to the Garden of Jezreel. When Jesus went off to pray, the disciples fell asleep. Very quickly, soldiers carrying torches for light and, car and carrying swords came to the garden to arrest him. The disciples were very, very upset and wanted to fight. Jesus said to them, Do not fight. God will be done. The soldiers took him to the palais to be judged. They asked the crowd if he should be released. The crowd answered back, shouting his death. They wanted him crucified. The sky grew dark. There was thunder and lightning. Then, before the sun set, Jesus' friends took his body, laid it in a tomb, they rolled a large tomb in front, of a, in front of the tomb, and a soldier stood God. Early Sunday morning, three days after Jesus had died, his mother and two women went to the tomb. The stone was gone. They screamed, who took Jesus away? A man dressed in a white appeared. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. He has risen. The women were so happy they went and told the disciples Jesus was alive. The disciples checked the tomb and all that was there was his, his burial clothes folded neatly. They left afraid because Jesus was not there. Mary Madeline remained crying. A man's voice was heard. Why do you cry? Mary said, Sir, if you have taken Jesus, where is he? The man whispered, Mary. She lifted her head, and Jesus was standing before her. She ran to the, the disciples and told them she, she saw Jesus. Jesus also Jesus also appeared to the disciples, and he said to them, Go tell the world you have heard and seen me, and that I will be with you always, and even until the end of time. We have to remember Jesus gave up his life because he loved us. So as we all are Christians, we rejoice because Jesus rose from the dead, and because of him, we, we are all will live, and this is why we celebrate Easter. I made um, little pictures of here of 
because next Sunday we're hoping to do our Palm Sunday walk if the weather is good. And this is Jesus um, entering Jerusalem. And this is their la the Last Supper. This is the Garden of Eden. And this is where he has risen. Also, um, my granddaughter Gabby, you all got this picture in your packets this week. And she drew, you know, colored in the picture to show you today. This is the, the Last Supper that Jesus had. But in our church, we do something like this. We, you know, we, we sit in our pews, and it's passed around by the deacons to us um, so we can share the bread and the wine. Um, I just wanted to explain, because the next few weeks, you know, we're going to be busy, and we have a lot going on between Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter, just so you, you children can understand what it's about. So let us pray, please. Dear God, as we bring in the spring with beautiful weather and things starting to grow, please watch and guide us the next couple of weeks as we become Easter people with all your wonderful plans you have. In the name of our resurrected and Savior Jesus, amen. I once knew a pretty amazing woman. Stannis was her name. Stannis and her husband lived just outside Boston where he worked at a tech company. He had a brilliant mind, worked with computers. It was a very high pressure job. But when he started showing signs of memory loss, forgetfulness, and disorientation, the family started to worry that he had Alzheimer's. Fortunately, they found a good neurologist who assured them that it was not, but he would not get any better unless he had a, a drastic lifestyle change. Lower the pressure. Get somewhere where you can be outdoors and move and, and truly live. So Stannis, her husband, their daughter, and their younger, younger son moved to Maine. They took up a, lower, a slower lifestyle, and it turned out it was a lifestyle that focused on helping the community that was so often in need in that, in that county, which is one of the poorer counties in the country. They moved into a big house that they could afford because the land prices were lower, and it had a barn and another outbuilding on it. And so they turned that outbuilding into a clothing bank for the community. The barn became a food pantry. They adopted a boy with Down syndrome. And that was just some of what this family was doing in their new community. And I was fortunate enough to meet them back in 1993. It's been a lot of years since I first met them. And I was able to see her and the family at least once yearly with our trips up to home co-op to do mission trips and every year I marveled at her stamina and her faith. Now when I first met the family, Stannis told, they told, we learned the story, the backstory of how they ended up there. And when we, we were leaving that day, Stannis said, now the next time you come, uh, Bruce may not recognize you, but you know, just, just realize that that may be the case because of you know, his, his illness. It turns out the next time I showed up, he was out in the yard and he did recognize me. And subsequent times after that, it really seemed to be a miracle. But their change of lifestyle made all the difference for them, for 
her husband and for the children and for the community. And then Stannis was diagnosed with cancer. I thought, being the person she was, that she would beat it. She had such sheer will that I bet she could beat it down and, of course, a very deep faith. But when I came to visit her, well, and that's in, in the last summer I saw her, I think she knew that death was coming, but it didn't stop her from living. When her daughter tragically died in a car crash, she established a youth center. She never stopped caring for her family and for her community. And so it was a very sad day when Stannis died. The loss of her left a hole that wasn't just an absence in her family, but in the town. But you know what? She taught others well. Her family survived and thrived. The community filled the holes that this amazing woman, uh, she filled the roles, they filled the roles this amazing woman played. Now, I, I tell you this story because I want to ask a serious, first of all, think about how this woman lived her life. And I also want to ask a very serious question. How would you live your days if you knew your time on earth was very limited? Now granted, our time is limited. We just don't know the day or the hour. <laughs> Um, because dying is inevitable. I ask that question, though, to help us put us into the mind of Jesus as he set his face toward Jerusalem, like Mary shared with our Time for Children today. She gave us the story of how Easter came to be, so we knew, we know, what Jesus was up to. But I think that question might help us put us in Jesus' mind as he answers his disciples and gives a message to the Greeks and the others that were asking to see him. By this time, when those Greeks came to see Jesus, he knew that the political and the religious tides were definitely turned against him, and his death was imminent, and he still had work to do. So Jesus really gives a powerful message to his foreign guests, though I suspect that people that were listening to what we just heard might have thought Jesus was some sort of prophet or mystic. Those who love their life will lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternity. A grain of wheat must fall to the ground and die before it can bear fruit. Those words must have sounded like poetry or madness. But then another sound broke the air, and I don't know if we always catch that in this passage. A sound breaks the air, and some people think it's thunder because they don't hear any words, but others think that Jesus is talking to an angel. But Jesus tells them it's neither one of them but a sign for them to listen. And that his last sentence to them was, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. You see, the Greeks that came searching for him gave Jesus a sign. He knew from scripture, from the prophecy, that he would draw people to himself. And he saw those, those foreigners coming and seeking him out as a sign that the hour was at hand. In the next days and weeks, as we journey with Jesus toward Jerusalem, we do begin to know his mind. We begin to recognize how he acts and speaks because he knows his earthly time is nearly over. And we see it, starting with his chat with his visitors today. Jesus, I think, was feeling motivated, maybe pressured, to continue to get his message out, to spread it as far and wide as he could. 
and that meant talking to everyone. He spent every day after that getting his disciples ready for what was to come, even though they, we, we will see as we look at the scriptures during Holy Week, we realize that his disciples just don't get it. They don't really want to get it because they don't want him to go. But with the promise of death at his door, Jesus didn't cower, he didn't cave, and he didn't crash and burn. He worked doubly hard to demonstrate mercy, to continue to heal, and to continue to show the way of true life. So in that mysterious way, when he was gone from this human life that we know, he would be with us and we would know him. That's what he was working to accomplish. And I might hear you ask, well, how, how are we supposed to know him? Well, through the stories, of course, through his continued works, through his disciples. Of course, we have the Bible, the Gospels that got written down, and the work of Paul, and all the letters that follow. But mostly, we know Jesus because the truth of life is written into our hearts. Remember those words of Jeremiah? I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. So maybe that unlocks a piece of the mystery that the presence of God is written on our hearts. That when Jesus speaks to his disciples, as, as we heard in the time for, Jesus, uh, for children with Mary, Jesus' last words to his disciples, I will be with you even to the end of the age. And he breathed his spirit on them. So let's take these few days until Lent is over Think about what is written on our hearts. Think about how God came to us and still comes to us in Jesus. Think about this legacy that we have inherited as his followers. And then maybe ask yourself a modified version of that question that seemed a little sinister when I asked it at the beginning. Now ask ourselves, how will we live each of our days knowing that Jesus' res death and resurrection are near? Now let us join in with our hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
I chose that hymn because it suited our approach to Jerusalem and this timing in Lent. And I hadn't read the note about the author of this hymn. Elizabeth Clefane was known during her short lifetime for her charitable work, charitable work in her hometown town of Melrose, Scotland. And so we have another example of someone who lived their life even though it might be short in, in giving glory to God and serving as Christ would serve. As we gather for a time of thanksgiving and prayer, I want to lift up with joy the celebration of the birth of Morgan James Jordan to Joy Lautzenheiser Jordan and Ray Jordan. Um, Morgan was born on the 13th of May and he was 20 inches long and seven and a half pounds. And uh, so we, we celebrate with Grandma Kay and Uncle Jason too. And so uh, we pray for this new family and this new life that has been born into our midst. I also want to lift up that uh, Brian Hager's son and daughter-in-law uh, are expecting a baby and they found out just recently that it will be a girl. So we celebrate with Brian and his family. So I invite you to be in the spirit of prayer with me. Oh God, in these times when we feel like we are gypped of the company of others and so many experiences that we might be having, having. Help us to remember that indeed you are a God of extravagant generosity. And as we come before you today with our prayers, we also offer the gifts of our lives to honor, honor you. They are a symbol of our devotion and in our giving, may our giving be a message of good news to the world that people do care and that you care, O oh God. And so we lift up in celebration and thanksgiving the new life of Morgan as he comes into this world and the, we pray for Brian's son and daughter-in-law and, and their good health as they expect a child as well. We lift up, O oh God, our health to you. As many of us continue to receive the vaccine and um, begin to get out and about a little bit more, we ask that you continue to help us to protect ourselves and others, but also rejoice in the in the opportunities that we are gradually gaining in our lives. Help us to learn from this past year. We have been facing this for a year. Um, help us to remember all the, some of the lessons that we have learned about, about uh, taking care of ourselves and, and you know, uh, preventing germ spread and that sort of thing, but also all the wonderful ways in which we've adapted our lives to be able to continue to remain faithful, to, to remain as community. And oh God, as we are reminded that you are written on our hearts, that your promises, your love, your guidance are written right in, in within us. Your presence becomes real to us. Help us to remember your real presence when we do find ourselves in the depths of our life situations, whatever they may be. Help us to remember that your care dawns on us when we feel your absence and that you would minister, minister to us through the spirit that breathes in each one of us, that you minister us to us through your word and your word who became flesh, born in a manger, who lived and taught and healed and challenged and led, even Jesus Christ. We pray especially for our world, O oh God, where we know that there are places of civil unrest, of war, 
we recognize also that there are those who are working for the healing of this world. People who teach singing to sold boys who were once soldiers in their youth, that in singing they breathe in your spirit and regain life and hope. For people who reach out and save people on a daily basis, those who work in healthcare and in, in emergency services, but also the stranger, the, the unwitting hero who steps in to lend aid. We pray that you will continue to watch over the leaders in our world, that your wisdom, that your truth, that your compassion will be their guiding light for the good of others. We pray for those who are in harm's way every day. We pray for the grieving, the sick, that your healing, that your uplifting hand will touch them and bring health and hope. We pause for a moment to bring you our personal prayers, O oh God. our prayers, O oh God, and remind us, even as we heard those words of Jesus today, those who will follow him may lose their life, that to follow Christ is a risky business. So as we continue on this journey of Lent, walking beside Jesus on his way to Jerusalem, Teach us the love that will go all the way to the cross so that we do not get discouraged or despair, but that we will serve with conviction and compassion, with care for all of your creation, for our neighbors and strangers, and for ourselves. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is My Song is Love Unknown.
we share our benediction, I do want to remind you that next Sunday, March 28th, at 9.30, praying that it is not blowing snow or sheeting rain, uh, we will gather at the Grange and begin our Palm Parade to the church um, at 9.30. And we will gather out front for a brief uh, celebration of worship as we follow Jesus and the donkey into Jerusalem that day. So now let us share our benediction and bless each other on our way. The love of God is at home in us. We go out in peace. The justice of Jesus is at home in us. We go out in hope. The wildness of God's spirit is at home in us. We go out in wonder and joy. Amen.